Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yasudian. I'm one of the dermatology consultants based in the UK. I'll be presenting uh, for the DermaMedCon conference and I thank everybody in the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. My topic is mucous membrane femphigoid and everyone may think that it is a fairly rare condition but in the next 20 minutes I will try and explain why it is an entity that we are best knowing a little bit about because of its uh, implications. So why do we need to know about this particular condition? The first is that it can have fairly serious complications, particularly in other mucosal surfaces. Uh, secondly, the treatment is slightly different from other immunobilis disorders, particularly in that we concentrate on the mucous membranes and also the medications that we use is a different order compared to other immunobilis conditions. And thirdly, we do need to involve other colleagues in the management. For example, our ophthalmology colleagues and oral medical colleagues will be very important. And in fact, multidisciplinary teams are required to treat this particular condition. What are the clinical features of this condition? It's a fairly rare condition, about two to five cases per million. So most of us will probably see at least four or five of these cases in our lifetime. Uh, the mean age is usually about 60 to 80 years, so older adults, and it is has a female preponderance. Like I mean, any other immunobilis disorders, it has its fluctuating course. It goes up and down from time to time, and the severity can be very variable. Sometimes it affects only one mucosal surface, and sometimes multiple mucosal surfaces and the skin as well. It's important to know the pathophysiology of this condition uh, and we all know that it's an autoantibody mediated condition and it's also against the basement membrane very similar to bullous femphigoid. So what are the differences between these two conditions? It's basically the antigens that are involved in mucous membrane femphigoid. We all know that the BP-180 is important for bullous femphigoid, but for mucous membrane femphigoid, there are other antigens which are also important. You will note that most of these antigens are in the anchoring filament area, not in the hemidesmosome, but below it. And the most important antigens are the laminin-332, the integrin alpha-6 beta-4, which is other, otherwise um, an important aspect which I'll tell you about in the next slide, and collagen 7. These are three other antigens which are involved apart from BP-180. So the, there are ways by which we can differentiate the clinical manifestations dependent on the antigen that is uh, attacked by the antibody. For example, if you have a purely ocular variety, the antibody is against the B4 subunit of alpha 6 beta 4 integrin. If it's a pure oral variant, the antibodies are against the alpha 6 subunit. If you have mainly BP180 antibodies, then it is most likely to be skin and perhaps mucosal as well. And finally, if you have laminin 332 antibodies, it's oral and ocular surfaces. At present, we have only the BP180 which we can measure, but hopefully with time, we will be able to get the antibodies against these other antigens and we will be clearly able to delineate which particular organ is going to be involved. Going on to the clinical manifestations, by far the commonest oral manifest manifestation is the oral mucosa. About 80 to 90 percent of our patients will have some form of oral involvement. The ocular mucosa is affected in about two-thirds, although in a series in which we looked at our patients, we had about 30 to 40 percent involvement. Next is the nasopharyngeal involvement and then the cutaneous changes can be about a third. And finally, the genital manifestations are the least common. What are the oral manifestations of this condition? Sometimes it can be the only manifestation. So it is very important to ask our patients if they have any oral uh, symptoms. It can be very non-specific. It's just like having an ulcer in the mouth. So it can be soreness while eating, soreness while swallowing, depending on where exactly the ulcers are. So the dysphagia occurs when you have the posterior pharyngeal involvement. The most important clinical manifestation is 
desmitic gingivitis so it's the gingiva which is the most commonly involved this is slightly different from other immunobullous disorders like femfigus where you have buccal mucosal involvement so it is a important distinct morphological change from other conditions that we usually see in our clinics and this is desmitic gingivitis it's affecting only one part you can clearly see that there's a small area here that is involved but sometimes it can be more widespread and the problem here is because of its widespread nature there's lots of soreness and then the person will not be able to brush their teeth or floss their teeth easily and therefore tartar starts to accumulate and the hygiene worsens and this is a vicious cycle the more they don't brush the worse it gets and then the inflammation also becomes compounded oral mucosal the other important clinical features is that you get tense bullae and the erosions are irregular and as i mentioned it can be in the front in the buccal mucosa but it can go right to the back as well including the posterior pharynx these are a couple of patients from our clinic and you can clearly see that there's an intact blister there which is very unusual for most immunobullous diseases for example in femfigus it's almost very very unlikely that we will see an intact blister because it's a sub epithelial while well, this is sub epidermal and these are the oral erosions that you see as well and the oral erosions are very very non specific you can't make a diagnosis purely on the oral erosion but if you see this tense blister and you get desmitic gingivitis then you can be a lot more certain that the diagnosis is mucous membrane femfigoid you can see it looks different in darker skin so in darker skin the erythema is not that prominent you can see a little bit of pinkness but actually there is a fair bit of inflammation and it's masked by the pigmentation in the background and here you can see an intact blister again it's hiding there so we have to be very careful when we examine our patients with skin of color let's go on to the ocular changes next and the symptoms again here can be very non specific it can affect the eyes by causing eye irritation dryness there can be burning and excessive tearing but none of them are very specific for this particular condition and the other thing is it it slowly progresses over many many months or even years so sometimes the patient may actually be having these symptoms and not tell you because they think it's not related so again it's up to us to ask our patients if they have any eye symptoms if we have the suspicion of mucous membrane femfigoid remember that the eye manifestations are by far the most important because if they lose their eyesight it cannot be retrieved that easily so it leads to blindness and therefore the most aggressive treatment is towards the ocular changes the ocular changes include simpliferon which is adhesions between the bulba conjunctiva and the palpebral conjunctiva trichiasis means there's inward movement of the eyelashes and that's a problem too because the eyelashes then starts going against the cornea and that causes damage to the eye Entropion is the worst because the entire eyelid looks inwards. At least with trichiasis, it's only the eye lashes. But with entropion, the whole eyelid margin goes inwards, and that's quite serious. And these are the things we want to try and prevent. If we've already reached this uh, this level, then we probably failed our patients, or they've come to us too late. And this is uh, simpliferon. That's the bulba conjunctiva. And that's the palpable conjunctiva and you can see a clear adhesion between the bulba and the palpable conjunctiva and this is the very very slow progression of the eye changes you can see earlier there's just a little bit of crusting and then as you go to b you can see a little bit of the simpliferon this starts getting more serious because it's more fixed and in the last you can see that the eyeball is completely fixed and the cornea is also affected and this is very late stage and unfortunately not much can be done if our patients come this late nasopharyngeal and symptoms are also important because the patient won't really volunteer this information to us they'll think that the nose problem is not related to the skin or the mouth and it looks just like a chronic sinusitis so again we we'll have to ask our patients specifically if they have any symptoms relevant to the nose if it's very uh, posterior like laryngeal involvement then you get hoarseness of the voice too 
And very rarely, deafness has been reported, particularly if there's middle ear involvement. Cutaneous involvement, which is what we look for the most, is seen in about a third, so usually 25 to 30 percent. And it's just like bullous femfigure. You'll get these really tense blisters and you'll get this erythematous base around it. The difference is that here you get scarring. So you'll get atrophy and around it you get scarring alopecia as well. And this scarring alopecia, unfortunately, once it occurs, there's not much we can do to revert it. This is a really interesting case, which I saw late last year, and I did an initial biopsy and the histology was reported as folliculitis decalvins. So I gave her rifampicin and clindamycin and I saw her very recently and noted that these small blisters were occurring. So we again did a biopsy, which was non-specific. In the meantime, she had gone to the oral medical department with descomitic gingivitis. And when they did the biopsy with immunofluorescence, that showed mucous membrane femfigoid. So you can see that we missed the diagnosis over six to eight months because it was purely in the skin and because the oral mucosal involvement came a lot later. So this lady has been started on Dapson very recently, but unfortunately the scarring process cannot be undone. And you can clearly see the small blister there. And if you look at the rest of it, you can see why it, it could fit into folliculitis decalvins. How do we investigate these patients? The most important is histology, but you need immunofluorescence. Direct immunofluorescence is the gold standard, and it'll look just like bullous femfigoid. Indirect, bullous, uh, indirect immunofluorescence is BP180, which, as I said, we can do. But all the other antibodies, for example, laminin-332 and the integrin ones, we don't have the antibodies yet. So in the future, by the time in the next 10 to 20 years, perhaps they will find these antibodies and then it will be a useful clinical test for us to do or a laboratory test for us to do. Histology is a sub-epidermal blister and you get a lymphohistiocytic infiltrate as a band, just like in any other immunobullous disorders like bullous femfigoid. The difference in mucous membrane femfigoid is that you see plasma cells, mainly because it's in mucosal surfaces. And secondly, you see fibrosis, which is what's different from normal bullous femfigoid. And this is the sub-epidermal blister. We can clearly see the split between the epidermis and the dermis at the basement membrane zone. And the typical continuous band of immunofluorescence, which you can see in mucous membrane femfigoid, very similar to bullous femfigoid. So the diagnostic criteria is most importantly the clinical criteria. You have to have tense blisters or erosions in the mouth or both. And along with that, the gold standard is the direct immunofluorescence. But not everybody gets the positive results. Therefore, you can sometimes rely on indirect immunofluorescence, particularly BP-180, or you can get histology as well. So you can see that the difference between bullous femfigoid and mucous membrane femfigoid sometimes, the way you differentiate it is depending on which mucosal surface is affected more. If the oral mucosa is affected more and there's scarring, it's mucous membrane femfigoid. If the skin is affected more and there's no scarring, then it's normal bullous femfigoid. The treatment, you always go through a therapeutic ladder. You start with topical agents first, then you go on to systemic agents, and then finally up to biologics. And most commonly, most of our patients will respond to some form of topical agents. This is a series of 42 patients, which we published a couple of years ago. Uh, this is our experience in the oral medical clinic in Liverpool. And we found the take home points are that about two thirds of patients responded either to Dapson or mycophenolate Mofetil. And we also found that two thirds of the patients achieved a very good response with either topical or systemic agents. So the topical agents are the first and you always use high potency topical agents. And we'll look at the varieties of topical agents that we can use in the next slide. Some general principles. The first thing is they shouldn't eat or drink for at least 30 minutes after they've applied the topical agent. And this can be a mouthwash a cream, or sometimes they can even use sprays. Maintaining good oral hygiene is very important. As I said, there's tartar buildup because patients don't want to brush their teeth or floss it. But this tartar worsens the underlying inflammation. Therefore, it's a vicious cycle which we have to break. So getting a good dentist, getting good oral hygiene is very, very important. 
Sometimes in oral medical departments, we use prosthetic dental trays. So these trays have the creams and then you fit the trays against the oral mucosa. But generally I found it to be quite unhelpful because patients are not able to tolerate keeping these trays on for long periods. Finally, topical tacrolimus has also been used. It's an ointment, but we can use, mix it with orobase and put it inside the mouth. Um, there are a couple of case reports of its effectiveness, but I have not found it that helpful in our series in Liverpool. So these are all the topical agents that can be used. There's in a tabular column in the article that we published, and it's very useful to have a, a note of this. The first and the last are probably the commonest things we use. We, use, we can use mouthwashes, sprays or ointments, but the betamethasone tablets, which we dissolve in water and use as a gargle is the simplest. So you dissolve it in about half a tumbler of water, you gargle it and ask them to spit it. And it's done about four times a day after the gargling for about two minutes. The last one is fluticasone nasal spray. So this is a spray and you spray it against the gingiva or against the oral mucosa, which is eroded. And that seems to be very effective when the condition is quite limited. You can use fluocinolone ointment or gel, mix it with oro base and then put it against the ulcers as well. But generally the first and the last, as I said, is the most useful. And you can see that there can be a good response just to topical agents. This is just topical steroids, betamethasone, and you can see the inflammation on the left and considerable involvement, uh, improvement on the right side just with topical agents. The systemic agents usually are first line steroids, just like with any other immunobilis disorders. But after that, the order changes slightly. Dapson comes next, then mycophenate, morphotel, azathioprine, and cyclophosphamide. Steroids are usually the first line agent. Usually you use it for a short course. It's used to get quick control. So you do it right at the start or when there's a crisis, you can use it again. It works rapidly. That's the main advantage. The problem is you can't use it long term because if you rely solely on steroids, you get all the other side effects. You need to use quite high doses if you want long term remission. Um, so using it for more than 12 weeks, three months causes multiple metabolic changes, which we usually try and avoid. So we use it along with other agents, steroids first and then switch it off and then other agents, second line agents take over. Dapson is the main drug that we use. Particularly when you have mainly oral disease, it's an excellent drug. You start off at a low dose, 50 milligrams, and then you work your way up. Usually between 100 and 150 works really well. Um, most of the oral conditions respond really well to this. In our series, 75% responded, but a few of them had side effects, tummy upset, some hemolysis. And if you get these side effects, then sulfapyridin is a useful alternative that you can consider. Mycophenolate mofetil is also helpful, about two thirds of our patients responded to it and it's for moderate to severe disease. So if you're getting oral disease, skin disease and early eye disease, then mycophenolate mofetil is a useful drug. And the dose, again, you start off a bit low, one gram a day, and then you work all the way up to three grams a day. And you have to take the same precautions as other cytotoxic drugs with regular blood monitoring. Azathioprine can also be used as a steroid sparing agent, but it takes a long time to work. So you're looking at its effects starting at about 8 to 12 weeks and then reaching its maximum effect between 3 to 6 months. So if you're going to use it, you have to use it for at least 6 months before you give up on it. And the dose is again up to 3 milligrams per kg body weight, but somewhere between 50 and 100 is the best option and then working our way up again. Cyclophosphamide is probably the most important for eye disease. So we don't deal with the eye condition ourselves. So we always send it to our colleagues in Liverpool Eye Hospital and they tend to use cyclophosphamide. It has a fairly narrow toxicity spectrum and also the marrow toxicity. So we don't feel comfortable initiating it in the oral medical department. But if they have any eye manifestations, if they use cyclophosphamide, it has effects on the skin and on the oral mucosa as well. So we generally reserve it for recalcitrant disease. The biologic agents are coming in in a big way. IVIG can be used 
and rituximab is fairly useful as well not as effective as femficus vulgaris but there is reasonable response so we have about four to five cases now when we did the series we had only two patients but we have about four to five patients now mainly those with eye disease who had skin and oral mucosal involvement and they have done reasonably well with this combination sometimes we use a small dose of prednisolone with it as well Surge day can be used, but this only for the eye disease because once the cornea clouds over, no medical treatment is going to work. So it's mainly for severe scarring of eye disease that is helpful. But you can do that only if the inflammation is controlled. So if the inflammation is still active in the mouth or in the eye, then naturally it's not the best time to start it. There is good surgery which is available by our ophthalmology colleagues, corneal grafting, amniotic membrane transplantation and if there is ingrowing eyelashes they can do a tarso raffi as well and all of this will prevent scarring of the corneal surfaces. This is a, a case report which I published quite a few years ago and you can clearly see that the corneal surface is really clouded on the top layer but after the amniotic membrane transplantation you can see some amount of a translucency and this patient was actually able to see after we did it but we did this with IV cyclophosphamide which the eye doctors had given in Liverpool. So I know it's a very big subject and I've covered quite a lot of topics so we'll just take a few points to remember. The most important thing is it's a multi-mucosal surface condition so even if you can manage the oral mucosal and the skin condition you always have to seek an ophthalmology opinion and this is because it can be very mild and we may miss it they have these special instruments by which they can look for scarring and for corneal changes so we always have to involve our ophthalmology colleagues and then keep them under survey once a year that's the ophthalmologist and secondly you have to treat it aggressively particularly when it starts Involving the oral mucosal surfaces, you can't leave it as a mild treatment. Even if the oral condition is mild, you always have to push for really, really potent treatment by our ophthalmology colleagues. Thank you very much again for inviting me to speak. I'd like to thank all the organizers of Dermo Medcon and also Dr. Sri Kumar for inviting me today. Thank you, Dr. Breathing. 
and uh, the ENT doctor picked it up because of the ENT was gifts. He found it to be lupus membrane peptidoid, slowly stenosing the larynx, the laryngeal stenosis. Those are some rare presentations we have to uh, be aware of. Uh, again, now we have the, the immunological testing like the BP180 and all, which was not available in my days. In my days, we only had clinical plus histology. Anyway, it was a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you very much again for inviting me to join. Thanks. Thank you. So it seems to be effective, but as I mentioned, it's not as effective as it is for when figures is for the guy on the or is ventilator. So the response rate seems to be somewhere between 50 and 70 percent. So nowhere close to almost cures, which we can sometimes make with ventilators on the guidance. And the other thing is we do seem to have to repeat the infused terms of rituximab. So the mean, mean period when they are reasonably clear is about 12 to 18 months. So they do need to have repeated courses of uh, rituximab. There was one series from France where they used one gram for two consecutive weeks and then kept, kept repeating it every six months. So that was the biggest series of 109 patients. And they had an inflammation rate of about 70%. IVIG can also be used, but it's incredibly expensive. It's nearly 100,000 pounds in the UK. So I have only two patients here. It seems to be effective, but that you need to probably continue just all the time. If you stop it, it just comes back. Thanks, Devaka. In fact, uh, that was uh, one of the questions in my mind. What exactly would be the dose of rituximab and how long you need to give it? Uh, you already answered it uh, very well. So, uh, what is the principle? Is it the uh, same like in front figures? You dilute and, uh, and you uh, produce, uh, uh, suppress the antibody formation. In other words, is there a role for combining IVIG and uh, rituximab or rituximab with uh, the conventional drugs like uh, steroids? Very good question, Sigma. Again, we, we don't know why we're not able to suppress it as effectively as the other intermediate dis disorders. So, you know, the CD20 is the main uh, plasma cell that is being affected by rituximab. There seem to be other T helper cells which mm -hmm. also seem to be playing a role in um, mucous membrane configuring. So, we are able to suppress some, but not all the autoantibodies which produce this particular condition. The antigens itself seem to be more than just the BP180. So, perhaps once we know which antibody to suppress and what subtype it is, then we will get a particular balance which will be more persistent in bringing about the remission of this condition. So it's still a vague entity where we are not 100% sure about the exact pathogenesis. And knowing the pathogenesis is the best way of finding out how to treat the person best. Absolutely, that's it. Thank you. Sir, we need your blessings. So far, things have been going well. But we absolutely require your blessings. A large number of your students are uh, there in this hall. Certainly, Sri Kumar. All the best. Delighted to be with you. And nice to see you regularly holding these conferences. It uh, shows uh, the bright future for dermatology in your country. Oh my God. Uh, it's all your blessings and your teaching. I would uh, request Dr. Priya also to forget to you. Unfortunately, we still don't have a, an agent which will bring about remission. 
but we can bring about some form of control with these two biological Dixonab and IVIG. Both, uh, unfortunately, quite expensive here in the UK, IVIG especially. So I'm afraid there is no other new drug that we have at present for this condition. And uh, Srikumar also mentioned using the two together, yeah, that's certainly possible. But again, it's the cost which seems to be the main limiting factor. Is there any ethnic predisposition among your patients in your group? That's again a very good question. Um, most of the patients I've seen are white. Um, in fact, I, I can't, I, I remember seeing one of, maybe two of the 16 being of ethnic predisposition, but most of them are white. So yeah, that's a very good observation. Thank you for the question, Professor. Again, there seem to be two ways by which leptin causes. One is that it actually unmarks previous polystyrene, right? And then there is the one where the specific drug itself causes it. So I think the ones you are mentioning are where it's unmasked the predisposition for polystyrene, right? Maybe they wouldn't have got it anyway, and this just unmasks it. And it can be difficult. I mean, I agree with you, the ones which are written and used do seem to be a little bit more serious and more difficult to control. Um, here in the UK, we tend to use microfinlet as a steroid sparing agent. So we do use higher doses for these severe polyaspect uh, patients, maybe half to one milligram a case body weight. And then once you could bring it down, usually microfinlet and morphotel seems to bring about some form of remission. Um, don't use methotrin except that much here in the UK. MMF seems to be the drug of choice here. Because since they are diabetics, you can't use steroids. And uh, uh, how is, uh, I want to know what is your experience with uh, either legitimate or even people are using omalizumab. Uh, in some cases. Uh, I have not used omalizumab, but I have two patients where I used legitimate when everything else has failed. Um, I don't know if there's a genetic predisposition, but the ones which we see in white skin tends to be less severe than the ones which I've seen when I was in India. So certainly even the Fenficus vulgaris patients which I saw in India, they were horrendous uh, severity, so hard to treat, and you have to use cyclophosphamide. Whilst here, you give them microphilia cocktail and most of them respond quite easily. So I think there probably is some form of genetic uh, risk factors for people of our skin, making it a bit more severe and making it a bit more recalcitrant to treatment. Again, again, that's a, a wonderful observation which you uh, mentioned right now. And how is the response with that zone? We, some of those seem to be getting a very good response with that zone now. And uh, what you used to feel earlier, how is your experience with that? Um, we tend not to use capsule for bullous ventricular. We use it for mucous ventricular. For bullous ventricular, we almost uh, have not used capsule in the UK. So it's always prednisolone first, then microfinet off two, and then if that doesn't respond, to it, then we try azathioprine, and then finally off to Bye. Bye. The say, advantage of the national health system, we don't worry too much about us. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, they seem to be milder here, so we don't have to use even my finger mouth to get high doses, and we use it usually for a short period and it brings it out of remission. It's very rare that I have such severe cases that I'm a, a micro, a that I need to go on to these biological cases. 